just so you know. Okay. Hey, Newton on the phone, contact. <laughs> Dan Newton on the phone, calm test. I'm sorry, are you here for the IPIN board? Yes, I'm a, a Dan Newton on the phone, just doing a calm test, please. Um, this is, you're in the wrong place if you're doing a calm test. And Ray Carr. Joan Corbin. Present. EJ, she's an Eddie. Present. Barry Lindahl. He was on. Barry, are you still on? Joel McGrath, here. Monica McHugh. Here. Julie Potter. Here. Jackie Schmellen. Dan's gone. So Dan and Jackie. Um, for Barry, that be six. Present. Barry was here. Barry was here. Let's see if we can find Barry again. Can you hear me? This is Danny. Danny, we can hear you. Um, when it comes to your time, then unmute yourself. I don't know if Barry had the internet, but he's not currently on. Okay. Uh, so you have a quorum. Nice little quorum. All right. Uh, do I have an approval of the agenda? Move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And has everybody read the minutes from last meeting? Are there any additions or corrections? If not, I'll ask for a motion and a second. With approval. We second. And we have a bit of approval. <clears throat> Any other comments? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 There. There's Barry back. Yeah, I got kicked off for some reason. I don't know what happened. Sorry, Barry. Yeah. All right. Um, we do have the public forum on. Uh, I don't think we've if we had one person speak. So if there's anybody who would like to speak in the public forum or you can wait for your case. If you'd like to speak in the public forum uh, and you don't have a case before us, then unmute yourself and let us know. All right. Comments from the board chair. So we have one member who is officially, this is her last meeting. So this is Julie's last meeting. So I would like to present to Julie a certificate of appreciation. Oh, so nice. Thank you. And then a little something for you. Um, should I open it now? I can open it now. Oh. Can you get the tape open? I should. Yeah. This was going to be such a challenge. <laughs> well, I'm trying to open this. Um, We have our attorney who's a member of the ICA board and she drives a cherry red vehicle. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Uh, I want to say how much I appreciate it being on the board when I I did not uh, consider applying when it went up to speed for the first year, as their attorney 
Oh, a strong <laughs> And um, Grandstead administration, Larry Johnson, tracked me down, and he was in Florida where I was on vacation. I wanted to know if I considered a position on the board, which didn't take me much thought. I just had so I didn't see myself as a board member, just as the lawyer. So I'm glad I did. Um, I've been impressed by the work the board does, get quality people every time. Sure. I'll be replaced by someone, maybe of even higher quality. I think what we do with the public is so important. One of the dangling issues that I'll talk with Erica about another time. As you know, 17A prohibits personally investigating, which I think literally applied would prohibit people from speaking to the board directly. They have to put their comments in writing. Um, we tried to get waivers, but people were suspicious of that. To do it. it could be a problem. We have a contested case that people would personally interview. But on the whole, I thought those opportunities for people were so important. And we have a contested case once in a that I wide. <laughs> we might make another stab at drafting a waiver that people don't feel so threatened by. I'm always impressed by the time people take to prepare comments. That they're a little nervous talking to the board, but I think it's important to preserve that opportunity for me. Anyway, appreciate I think really being on the hands of a very good executive here. We've got a little staff. <laughs> I've enjoyed my time here immensely. I appreciate it, especially when I needed help with legal things because I'm not an attorney, nor would I care to be. <laughs> but it helps to have a good perspective and, and history, which makes a big difference. And if anybody for any reason wants to talk to me, then I've gone, I'm perfectly willing to staff or to you or members. I have not lost your number. I have. Feel free to call me. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for your years of service, not only as a member of the board, but chair of the board. You've been a highly effective member, and uh, it's been a pleasure to serve with you. And I'll echo those comments, Julie. I think your contribution for the years that I've been on the board has been invaluable because many of us come on, and uh, even though we're attorneys, we don't know. Despite what might it may or may not be perceived, we don't know what um, most of the time this is on Wednesday, but uh, I really appreciate your, your input and uh, many times look to you for those very close questions. So thank you very much for your service and effort as well. And last but not least, I brought cookies. <laughs> oh, great. That's kind of a graceful thing to do, I guess, but I wanted to do something. I got a nice bit. Um, I we didn't have anybody uh, to uh, speak for the um, public forum, but there was somebody else that joined, and I don't know if they would like to speak. Um, hi, I'm Megan Rosenberg. I apologize. I'm attorney for the city of Hampton, and so I have no public comment. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, we'll move on to the advisory opinion. All right. Um, this is an advisory opinion regarding Chapter 22 requirements for the municipal fire and Re police retirement system of Iowa. Uh, a request was made for member and beneficiary records um, uh, with the MFPRSI. Um, the, after they were informed that the records were confidential, uh, the request was amended to align with the administrative rules from 2021 uh, which uh, asking for the name and city affiliation of all members uh, in the definitions of the administrative rules. It stated that personal information means information pertaining to or about an individual in a record, which identifies the individual which is contained in a record system. Name and city affiliation of a member are not considered, quote, personal information for purposes of this chapter. 
uh, in reviewing it, it was uh, the uh, statute had been amended in May 2022 by House Ballot 2154. That uh, piece of legislation did change the language within the MFPRSI statute, uh, Title Code Chapter 411, in that it e eliminated the statement upon which the administrative rules definition had relied about uh, member and beneficiary records containing personal information and not being uh, considered personal information. Uh, and it's explicitly stated that records containing names or addresses of members or their beneficiaries was not subject to open records under Chapter 22. Um, however, it did also allow that summary information con concerning demographics of the members and general statistical information uh, as an aggregate could be could be released under Chapter 22. So in reviewing this, while well, the administrative um, uh, rules had not been updated uh, after the language was changed in the statute. Uh, the statute would control in this case, and the member uh, names and addresses of members and their, and their beneficiaries would not be subject to 22, but uh, MFPRSI could provide statistical information about the number of members per uh, city affiliation of under Chapter 22. They answer any questions. Does anybody have any comments, questions on the advisory opinion? They're straightforward to me. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. In a second, I'll, is there any other comments on um, the advisory opinion? If none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. All right, Travis Johnson in Eddysville, Blakesburg, Fremont. Community School District. All right, uh, this is case number 23 FC 0100. This is an informal resolution final report. Uh, this is a case that was before the board in which, in which Mr. Johnson alleged, alleged that at the start of the board meeting in October, uh, the published agenda was amended to add an action item regarding uh, a voluntary uh, archery coach. That item was discussed and board action was taken at that meeting. Uh, I have accepted the complaint on November 16, 2023, and pursuant to Iowa Code Section 23.9, the parties agreed upon terms for an informal resolution of the matter. Uh, the district assigned the agreement on January 15. Mr. Johnson signed it on uh, January 18, and the board approved the resolution February 15. Um, the parties had 60 days to meet the terms of the resolution. The district did acknowledge violations of Chapter 21 and voted to nullify the actions regarding the archery codes that were taken at that meeting. Uh, and um, uh, the on March 25th, Iowa, uh, Iowa Public Information Board staff did provide training for the district. Proof of compliance with all the terms have been provided, and it is therefore recommended that I could dismiss this complaint as successfully resolved. Do we have uh, Mr. Johnson on the phone who'd like to make any comments? Hi, I'm sorry. Oh. Hello? Is this, yeah. a, this is, I'm sorry, I'm not Mr. Sure work We're looking for Travis Johnson from Iowa. Oh, Johnson, I thought you said Jensen, I'm sorry. That's all right. All right, uh, anybody from the Annieville, uh, Blakesburg, uh, Fremont Community School District? Don't appear to have anybody. Uh, are there any comments from the board? If not, I'll ask for a motion in a second. Second. Any other board comments? 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Are we moving to dismiss successfully? Yeah, yes. we do. We need to move to dismiss. And I will say the parties um, did work together to negotiate and work to resolve the issue. Next case, uh, Mia Schwery and the city of Butte. Or did I? Oh, did should we I jump? I went. Oh, yeah. oh, that's right. Whoops, I'm sorry. That's right. You did tell me that. Um, John Wan, Courtney Mam, and the Mammon, I believe. I'm sorry if I gave that wrong. And the River Valley School Board. This is case number 23 FC 0105. Uh, sorry, this was a last minute addition. But it is a combined informal resolution and final report. Uh, this was the case in, where the complainants alleged that River Valley School Board had a board meeting and took a vote to establish sports sharing activities with another school district. Um, the, the agenda was not specific uh, as deemed by the, the board. There also was a, uh, the board failed to physically post the agenda um, before the meeting. It had been sent out by email. Uh, the board did accept the complaint on January 18th, 2024. The parties worked uh, toward an, an informal resolution of this matter. Um, and the uh, district signed the agreement at their meeting on April 15th. Ms. Mammon had signed it on March 26th, 2024. Mr. Law has not been in communication with IFIB since uh, the complaint was uh, addressed by the board. Uh, the district uh, has complied with all of the provisions in the uh, informal resolution. They reconsidered the sport sharing issues at a properly noticed meeting with proof of physically posting the agenda at least 24 hours in advance. Um, the uh, Iowa Association of School Boards did provide training to the district on April 15, 2024, and the district did approve the informal resolution at their meeting. In terms of the informal resolution, address the matters presented in the complaint, and proof of compliance has been provided to IPIB. Uh, therefore, uh, we are asking for approval of the informal resolution and, and final resolution of dismissal in this case. Do we have uh, either Mr. Lawyer or Ms. Mannon on the line who would like to speak? Do we have anybody from the River Valley School Board? Yes, this is Christy Latta from the Allers Law Firm. I, I don't have anything to add other than, um, yeah, we're hopeful that this resolves the matter. I think the district has complied with everything in the resolution agreement. Thank you, Ms. Latta. Any board comments? If not, I'll ask for a motion to approve the informal resolution and dismiss the case. So moved. Okay. Motion a second. Any other comments from the board? All in favor? Aye. 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 So, okay, now, sorry about that. Now we can go to the Leah Query and the City of Butte. All right, this is case number 23 FC 0118. In this case, uh, Ms. Schwery filed a formal complaint uh, alleging that the city violated um, chapters 21 and 22 at a regular council meeting. Uh, they failed to uh, include an agenda item regarding termination of the complainant um, as city clerk. Uh, upon review, the IPIB did accept the complaint finding that there was a potential violation of Chapter 21 and that uh, IPIP did try to work with the parties. Ms. Schwery did not uh, respond or provide further communications regarding this matter to IPIP, um, uh, despite uh, attempts to, to get her input. The city signed the informal resolution on March 6, 2024, and um, all of the terms uh, that IPIP had included within that informal resolution were completed uh, by the city on April 8, 2024, uh, and IPIG was provided notice of the completion of all of that. 
At this time, the city has done everything requested to resolve the complaint. Uh, and Mishwari has not uh, provided any additional comment. Uh, so therefore, um, no additional uh, information other than outside of what was in the acceptance has uh, come to light. And uh, so the board is upon the board to make a determination of how they want to proceed with this uh, case. It is recommended that based on the city's responsiveness and um, complying with the terms of the informal agreement provided by IPIB, uh, and work to remediate the violation that uh, the board dismissed this as an exercise of administrative discretion. Is. All right, do we have Ms. Schwery on the line? No. Do we have anybody from representing the city of uh, Ute? On the line. All right. Board comments. Discussion. If not, uh, I can get a uh, motion. I will move to dismiss this case as an exercise of administrating discretion. Second. Motion and second. Any other board comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Mm. Uh, next one, uh, Tracy Stillwell and the Hampton Public Library. This is case number 23 FC 0126. Um, this is a revised acceptance order. This was before the board, I believe, in January. Uh, at that time, uh, the board reviewed the Stowell's complaint against the Hampton Public Library uh, that they violated on Code Chapter 22. Uh, she made a records request in October to the library and was provided an estimate for fees um, that were uh, she stated not reasonable. There were some questions about that. Uh, the board did direct staff to try to work with the parties to uh, address that issue uh, rather than accepting the complaint at that time. I think staff did attempt to work with the parties to put together a reasonable estimate of the records request. Uh, on, uh, during that, the period of that conversation, it was discovered that uh, the library uh, thought they only had 30 days of emails available to them, uh, which was what was available on um, Ms. Manning's computer, and they were uncertain where other emails were hosted or stored. Uh, there's an automatic delete after 30 days uh, on the computer. Um, there's been several meetings and discussions back and forth. At this point, um, uh, we still don't uh, entirely know when uh, or if those emails are available or where we are moving forward. So uh, we are making a recommendation uh, to accept this complaint um, based on uh, extensive delay in getting the records and uh, trying to address the records request as it is. Um, so that is our recommendation. We did try to work with the library to provide a reasonable estimate. Um, those efforts have failed. Uh, we have not uh, gotten further information about the availability of the records or the ability to fill the records request uh, at the time we submitted this uh, draft document. Ms. Stillwell, are you available for comment? Yes, I am. Okay, uh, you have five minutes. Okay. Um, I guess one of my biggest concerns, you know, was obviously the amount of money and no actual estimates as to what it would be. But then once we got moving forward and we tried working with the library, um, after six months time, we were told that the emails were deleted, where on October 26th, I have a letter from Miss Manning that said, the library staff had already begun to gather the information. And I just question why and how and where those emails disappeared to and um, why they're having such a hard time recovering them. And 
I've spent the last year and a half attending meetings, and there's been many references during meetings of maybe a quote from something that they would go back and check the emails. And it's, it's just never been mentioned that their emails are deleted and nothing in the letters that I received from her, you know, back in October that that was an issue. I just really question that of how and why and where those emails are. And also, um, there's a very specific section in Iowa code under 2213 for libraries because they've questioned that there would be personal patron information on some of these emails and that's why they had to have possibly two law firms go through them all but there's very specific in that that no personal patron information can be released to anybody under unless it's with a criminal investigation and um so I don't understand why those would be an issue for the specific recipients I asked to have the information from. Um, Ms. Rosenberg had said that maybe somebody else that was writing to them released somebody's name, but Kim's policy at the library, she has stated many times is that's never discussed. She will never discuss personal patron information not even of a minor child with a parent and so i really feel that this has all been to deter me from receiving the information thank you thank you miss noble do we have anybody from the hampton public library um yes this is uh, megan rosenberg i'm attorney for the city of hampton um you got five minutes. thank you um just briefly um the library got the uh, attorney involved after we received the um the notice from mr torsdahl which i believe we had a meeting then in um let me just check the date there um we had a, a meeting with him i believe at the end of january and we had formulated a game plan that <clears throat> At the time, the director, um, Kim Manning, was going to uh, retrieve those. She had some personal things going on. And so when I followed back around with her is when she discovered that um, her they only had 30 days at a time. Um, we then tried to find who the server is. This is a small library. We don't have a, a full-time tech person. Um, and so I did update. Um, everyone on that 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 we had um basically we had to enlist not just the um the local commercial it department that the library uses and sometimes the city uses we also had to contact a, another um, it guru basically and finally um, on our third attempt the county it department was able to get a hold of us or was able to track down the server um and that was toward the um, middle to end of March. Um, they tracked down the server. Um, and I believe that the new library director has been in touch with someone who can, believes he can retrieve those, but we are just having difficulty finding an, an expert to do that in a timely manner. And when I spoke with the library director beginning of this week, um, she said she's spoken to him, but he doesn't know when he can get in to do that or how long it's gonna take him to be in. And so um, I can understand Ms. Stilwell's frustration with the delay here. Um, again, I think it just kind of was a perfect storm of, of um, not having an IT department, having a director that was um, working on retiring and then had some, some personal issues come up and the new director has been responsive. And I believe we have emailed or communicated um, about this weekly, um, since she took over at the beginning of the month. And I can understand, like I said, I can understand Ms. Stilwell's frustration. Um, the library is trying to find this and trying to enlist help as we can. Um, as far as, and I, I think that in, in my mind is the biggest problem that the board is concerned with. Um, as far as the other concerns that Ms. Stilwell has, um, 
we kind of discussed in one of our one of our meetings with Mr. Torsdahl that there are a number of things that could be confidential um, contained in these in these um, these correspondence, and I think that. <clears throat> My understanding is that the board is here to address whether whether um, or not this delay is reasonable or just to accept it, I think, to stay on top of this. Um, and anything that may be objectionable with the policies of the library or the how statutes are written regarding policy or privacy or constitutional rights with that, that's outside the scope that we're talking about today. I think today we're here to talk about the talk about the delay and like I said, it has taken a long time. My apologies. It's not something the library isn't taking seriously. We just have kind of felt like we're chasing our tails trying to track this down. So that is the position of the city of Hampton, unless the director, um, Susie Knickel, um, has an update on the gentleman she found to hopefully retrieve those emails. Thank you. Do we have any board discussion? I think I think that the library director Susie is trying to join, but she is muted. Okay, can you hear me now? So yes. um, okay, so my name is Susie Kniffel. I assume the duties of interim director April 1st. So I have been in contact with um Jerry Balmer, who is from the State Library of Iowa. He is the IT guy who will retrieve the records from the server there. Um, I also told them we had a meeting today. If I could get any, you know, any response, I did not. He, he did not give me a time, any kind of a time frame when these would be retrieved. So we are literally waiting for the State Li Library of Iowa to respond. And I spoke with Megan earlier in the week and that is the last I've heard Megan, so. <clears throat> That that's where we're at. Once those are retrieved, the ball can get rolling here with Megan. Then Megan will take over there with the emails. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. I have one more. This is Tracy Stillwell. I have one more question to that. So the original uh, estimate would be that the IT person from Rockwell would spend possibly up to four hours to retrieve. And now that we have, you know, gotten other people involved, what will those fees be and who will be responsible for those fees? That's, that's part of the informal um, resolution. And so, um, the, the board will, will uh, now discuss the, the acceptance order. This appears to me to be a perfect case for acceptance. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, everybody appears to be in good faith, so all I need is somebody to keep them up. We have a discussion, I guess, so I would not support the recommendation of staff. A question for the library director. Does it sound like the person from the state is going to be able to retrieve the emails? Okay. Yes. Oh. So to answer um, Tracy's question, Rockwell Communications could not retrieve our emails because they are deleted um, after 30 days. And then the only way to retrieve is from the state library server. So Rockwell Communications, they were done. They could not help us at all. But um, the State Library did tell me as far as he knew, there would be no charge for retrieval. It's a matter of when he can do this and, um, you know, how many there'll be. I gave him the date range and, you know, like I say, we we have to sit and wait, unfortunately. My plan is to contact him at least weekly to see, you know, if we can speed this up, but I, you know, I can only do so much here. So, you know, that, that, that's what the library is currently doing. I agree with EJ, I think we could be a help here. Um, 
um, I will move to accept the acceptance order. So, motion. Okay, Gary's got a second. Yeah. Are there any other discussions on uh, the acceptance order? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We've accepted the acceptance order. Thank you. Thank you. The next one, Andrew. Kitta in Clinton County. This is case number 24FC0003. In this case, Mr. Kita, uh, sorry, Howardson, um, alleges he made a public records request to the county in November of 2023 requesting email, text messages, and social media communications between uh, County Supervisor Aaron George and City of Clinton Council Member Rhonda Kearns between January 1, 2023 and November 14, 2023. He also filed that request with the city of Clinton, which is not subject to this complaint. In comparing the records provided by the county with those provided by the city, uh, Mr. Keita alleges the county failed to provide some records of text messages he received from the city. Um, text, he stated that the text threads between Ms. George, Ms. Carnes, and multiple other individuals are the only ones missing along with the associated attachments. Um, and that uh, in responding, the county stated that the records that existed were provided to Mr. Kita in regards to the deleted text messages. Uh, the county did provide a signed statement from Supervisor George that she did search her device and has provided all records to the best of her ability. They also provided a sworn affidavit from Supervisor George affirming no messages were deleted after receiving the request. Messages were deleted um, as part of a, a memory issue on the phone. Uh, the applicable law is that if a government official or employee uses a privately owned electronic device, um, such as cell phones or computers, to conduct that official government business, then the record generated is a public record. In this matter, the issue is that the text messages on Ms. Uh, Supervisor George's personal phone were related to county business and our public records and would be required to be released if there's no confidential exception. In this case, um, some of the messages were deleted. Um, uh, IPIP, again, strongly recommends against utilizing text messages um, to conduct business. However, these text messages um, under the sworn statement had not been deleted. Um, they were deleted before the request was provided. Uh, Iowa public records law has no specific retention requirement for records. Um, and had these messages been deleted after a request was made, such action would have amounted to a refusal to comply, a violation of Chapter 22. However, um, evidence uh, was a sworn affidavit affirming text messages were deleted prior to the records request being made, and no contrary evidence has been provided. Um, under these specific facts, a uh, violation of Chapter 22 is unlikely to be found and recommending dismissing the complaint. Do we have Mr. Kita or Kita on the line? I'm here and it's Kita and thank you for you yeah. have, most of the way through thank it. You. It's, okay. I'm sorry. I'm okay. it's amazing uh, uh, it stirs everybody up in the different directions. That's okay. That's right. That's yeah. right. Okay, so you've got five minutes to respond. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you to the commission uh, for what you do and the service you provide. I'm a fellow public servant and and I understand the perils and I appreciate your your uh, efforts for the citizens of the state. Um, I read the uh, the motion there to dismiss and I can say a few things. Uh, I believe that's accurately recorded to my position. Um, I do believe the record was deleted. I stand by my claim as to why it was deleted there is information in there uh, where it appears there was collusion between two elected officials to mask who's behind a lawsuit against the city of Clinton for a process they were going through. That's why I personally believe the uh, messages were deleted, and, but there's no proof for that. Uh, I also provided the, the context of the texts and the text messages I received from the city of Clinton. And for me personally, it reads out of a, the script of Mean Girls. Uh, it's it's unfortunate that people in public officials behave that way. 
I will stand by my claim and I can you I understand there was an affidavit signed highlighted with capital letters noting that it was the supervisor's personal phone and she underscored it a couple of times. So I believe that just clearly indicates to me that there was a fence taken that uh, the the personal phone which was used for government use was being FOIA'd. And you could sign an affidavit saying I provided all the information that things were deleted before the FOIA was requested. And I can provide you an affidavit that says, I believe I'm the Pope. That doesn't make me the Pope. So as I said, I've read the dismissal and I'm gonna say this as a fellow public servant, if we allow that to be the case, then the advice to every public servant is if you communicate via text message, just delete it right away before a FOIA comes in. And that's a very dangerous ground to walk on. That is a slippery slope. And to use the excuse that I needed to save space on my personal phone is unacceptable to me. As a public servant, our primary focus should be preserving the record so that the taxpayers and citizens of the, of the state can have access to deliberation as to what is happening when elected officials are doing certain things or taking certain actions. We have a we have a right to understand that deliberation and in this case that deliberation was deleted and i believe it was for reasons other than i needed to save space on my phone there's no proof for that that's okay uh i believe though that if we create this this position of it was deleted before the foil was filed therefore there's nothing to see here that to me is is the exact opposite of what we should be doing as public servants it is the record and those lessons should be taught to everybody who serves in the public of the state of Iowa. And that's an obligation that we have to the citizens of Iowa. I maintain my own uh, personal cell phone. I don't conduct city business on it. I have a city cell phone. It's a hassle to carry two phones, but I've been doing it my entire career for a reason. And that reason is exactly why we're here today. So uh, that's the input that I have. There's nothing more I think I can do to, to sway this this board to have a different opinion i understand your position and what you're saying about the law and if that's going to be the case then we probably need to look at changing that law because it's not fair to the to the citizens of the state of iowa that that uh public servants are allowed to just delete the record before a foia comes in thank you thank you mr Keaton. do we have anybody from the uh county of uh from clinton county i'm here and Holly Morgrie, uh, Clinton County. I uh, have read the acceptance uh, order I was proposed also, and I would urge you to accept it. It states an accurate uh, description of the law and I on the state of the law. I, much of what I just heard had to do more with records retention than it has to do with uh, public records requests and how those were complied with. The only thing I will know in some of the characterizations I just heard on behalf of my client, it, it doesn't makes sense to me why uh, Ms. George would perjure herself months after the request was made and after Clint, the city of Clinton had already produced these records that were deleted when they, when they had, she hadn't deleted the records. It just makes no sense that she would then sign a sworn affidavit line uh, in addition to, I believe she took that seriously and that's the truth, she would not perjure herself. So that's all I have. And thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. This one always bothers me because we had something similar during the pandemic. And with one of the state officers. And my concern is some of the same concerns that Mr. Keita had that just because you have a personal phone and you think it is nobody can touch it when you're a public official and that information is used in your public official response i think there's training that needs to be done that says you need to keep these keep this information um, because it can be quiet and even though it is very possible that she did delete and she did not perjure herself. I have always had a concern with public officials using private phones, and then somebody sends a FOIA request, and oh, sorry, I deleted it. But they've got 
years of other text messages that are personal. Um, that's my preference. I just I have a very difficult time with with that. I would agree with the chair's observations. I, I've had problems with this issue in the past. As mentioned by again, I, I don't know whether there's any merit in trying to bend the statute. I don't think people should be allowed, <coughs> excuse me, elected or appointed officials. Public officials should be allowed to use the phone private. I think there also be a retention requirement of 90 days or something, but whether or not we can be successful in recommending that to the legislature. I am sensitive to this matter. But in this case, I agree. I'm not sure we can do any more than we've done. I, yeah, I, I, I have a, a difficult time with it, especially, I mean, I'm an iPhone carrier. I don't know if her phone is an iPhone or not, but I use a backup. And I can go back to any date since I've had my accounts, one that, that I understand where the dismissal is coming from. But I do have a very difficult time with this because if it's your public official, you should know that whatever you do needs to be retained because it, it is public information. I would just add to that. I, I agree with your sentiments about this. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in the time of been serving this capacity is that the general populace, even though they can read the uh, chapters for themselves to understand what our jurisdiction is, still gets frustrated with the, these kinds of situations when it doesn't meet what seems reasonable, a reasonability in terms of transparency. It doesn't it doesn't meet the legal what's legally in the code? But people who from the various capacities have kept. We've heard them get frustrated with these kinds of things where the chapter says it would be a clear violation if it was deleted after the request was made. And I think, um, you know, it's frustrating for me too because in the spirit of transparency, it seems that that would be um, something to be worked with. But I also understand that it doesn't meet the letter of it. I have a note for the legislative committee also to work with this summer. So good. Looking for something to do. Pretty easy to get a test. Oh, oh, is there a raise up? Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Are you? Would you like? Yeah, yeah, Mr. That that was, that was me. That that was me raising my hand. I would just uh, affirm what what has been said here to say that. When I have new council members come on, the first thing I do is I teach them about text messages and what to do and what not to do. And they could all testify to that. And they will, they'll they tell you, I provide them that training. And I'll also add, I'm on my fourth uh, city phone. Three of them have met uh, tragic ends, whether they've fallen into the river or they've shattered the screen. I have the phones in my possession in case a FOIA ever comes up about text messages. And those are the obligations that we should be preaching to our public servants. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I believe it was for first development. We went through this. Yes, site, we did. And we, they've changed their practices. Yeah. But, although at the moment, I don't recall whether we accepted it and then negotiated um, it. I believe it was accepted. I don't know if the policy came out of that, but I do remember seeing the policy. Um, I think we did. I think we did too. I think we accepted it. And, and the important thing is, that it was resolved moving forward as the director. Yes, I was self on from your business and that they weren't recoverable. Yeah. So to clarify, when you spoke to you weren't sure that statute the statute needed to be changed, but are those some of the potential conversations on the legislative committee? I think we mentioned it, but we didn't go any place with it. Okay. We were, it I, I have a, a note. Uh, for something for the legislative committee to consider. Um, or we would need to work with the other groups, but I think it's something certainly for the legislature to look at. I think we talked about very I remember Joel yeah. we talked about it, but it was I think might have been before Eric was here as I was called. I'm not sure. But I I I, I certainly try to take do something about it now whether or not it goes any further than us to open the issue. 
we can only do so much. I, I think it's important that every elected official know that when they have conversations through text messages with another city official, uh, a member of the public asking something, that is public information. And they should know that that needs to be retained. And I think that's the, the main part of it. Uh, yeah, I do my part on this one with the director. And, yeah. Yeah. On this, this particular case, I'm born between accepting it and providing training. Yeah. And power of the sworn affidavit. So that, that's where I'm caught in between wrestling. Training could be beneficial. Uh, how many how many members of the supervisors are there? I do not know that off the top of my head. I don't know. Three or five. Three or five. Or five so. There are three members yeah, of the Yeah, I was going to say, Clinton and Jackson both have three. Um, well, the recommendation is a dismissal um, based on uh, the current facts. Uh, there is nothing prohibiting us from offering training uh, for their. Uh, Council to perhaps work with them on a policy. If you want us to table this and come back with an acceptance to do that, we can. Um, but I'm not sure under the facts that there's a violation. I, I would agree. I mean, you get the same place. I think they've indicated the willingness to cooperate, to do some training. The legislative committee, I think, might be wise to take up. Most people know if you're using a personal device, I think you have to public business, it's accessible, but it wouldn't hurt to codify that. Uh, no, I agree. I, I think, quite frankly, I could have a question because using personal. I use words to do personal, I get it, but yeah, anyway. Um, I don't want to already do this, but he was well received by my client if I went back and uh, let them know that it was a strong recommendation of this board that although there was legal compliance here in the best practice, uh, they felt you know, there could have been some training to have better best practices. Would that be acceptable to the board of a I hate to I hate to accept it for my client because it will result in more rental fees to the same. Right. Just okay. That's reasonable. I mean I I think that is reasonable. Um I would like to see them have the training and, and very strongly worded that yeah. documents need to be kept. And um, uh, I, I can recommend that to them as a best practice, but you know, as a lawyer in the state of Iowa, if I'm giving them a correct recitation of the law, no, no and, and that's true. And that's yeah, true. That's but I would, yeah, if you could strongly suggest that they do training to know. And they could certainly look at their retention policies and, and perhaps address that or have some understanding for public officials about if they're going to use a private phone, um, what the retention or anything on that would be. Um, I would say not using a private phone, but uh, understood. Uh, so if that would be acceptable to the board, you know, if uh, Director Eckley would send me an email just that said, this may be dismissed. This is not to the board, you know, it's a kind of deal. But we would strongly recommend that you undergo some training on best practices. I'll hold that on to my client for recommendation as well. I think that would be a well received by the county attorney. I would assume that they have a records retention policy in Clinton County. And I wonder if they just, I wonder if it does cover. Private phones, you know, private. I don't know that. That would be interesting to know is if that is already in their policy. They can look into that. They just some yeah. You know, EJ, the problem I have with prohibiting it is that sometimes it's the only way to get a hold of people. Yeah. 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 I'm not arguing. I just try to live in a prison world. <laughs> well, I think it's perfect. Well, with the past Main Street Council, you have a client that wants to follow your, uh, your recommendation. 
Well, I, just, I didn't know they were <laughs> I want to be very mindful that I haven't spoke with them about this as an option, and I just I, recommend it, but I cannot promise you all that they will do it. I, I think it will be well received. I'm very interested. I know you are. <laughs> Anyway, time for a motion. Yeah, I, I'm open to a motion in a second. I move the approval of the dismissal order. Second. I have a motion and a second uh, for the dismissal. Any other board comments? Barry, you've been quiet. Do you not have any comments on this? No, it's, you know, we struggle with the retention requirements in Dubuque. I mean, we don't have one, we have a policy. Uh, there are some code sections that require certain records to be kept, but as far as text messages, emails, I think it's unusual in most cities to have a retention policy. So it's it's a difficult situation. All right. All in favor of the dismissal order? Aye. 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 A very low eye. No, any opposed? <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kita. Thank you all. Uh, thank you all. And uh, I, I have no objection to your actions. Thank you all very much for your effort. Thank you. Thank you. The AG's office people usually did. There was one agency that did, and I was so surprised. I said, Was I unclear? Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Bobby Castillo and Union Emergency County for Emergency Management Agency. Um, this is case number 24 FC 0013. Um, this acceptance order. Ms. Castillo alleged that the uh, emergency management agency has not maintained and does not have available board minutes. Um, she alleges that a board member requested meeting minutes um, and they were not immediately provided to a board member. She also alleges that the uh, agency had a closed session called by the county attorney on January 24 that was not published on the agenda or announced prior to the closed session. Um, Ms. Duckworth from the agency re responded and stated that uh, the commission member's request for minutes was uh, provided the same day as requested, uh, just not immediately while she was in the middle of something else. Uh, she does, however, admit that the agency held a closed session that was not on the meeting agenda because the attorney did not tell her about it. Um, based on um, and this, uh, the recommendation is that uh, this be accepted because a closed session was held without um, um, proper uh, notice or uh, voting on the um, meeting. Uh, and so therefore uh, recommendation of, of acceptance. Uh, Ms. Castillo um, did provide a statement uh, that uh, just wanted to make sure that it was stated uh, that the uh, Agency did not vote to go into closed session. I'm not sure if that was included in. Um, and, and I, this is Bonnie. I am on if I can make a statement. Um, yes, uh, you have five minutes. Okay, thank you. So um, I just want to say that. Um, I had also made that request for the commission meeting minutes. Um, they were requested from Joe Duckworth because she had announced that she no longer planned to retire and that she had made a statement that she had not provided a resignation letter, a resignation date, and that the commission had never voted to approve her retirement. Um, she did provide a group of minutes um, upon request, but she had also stated that the December 22nd or December of 2022 and December of 2023 meetings were not held and the meetings did not exist. So after I had made this complaint, the commission met for the regular February meeting. And during that meeting, a commission member announced that he had actually found the meeting minutes from December 20th of 2022 and January of 2023. The meeting minutes contained missing the missing met, excuse me, the missing resignation letter, the date of resignation, and the vote to approve the retirement, which she said had not happened. Um, so I have a great concern that um, the meeting minutes were able to be lost. And if a commission member had not retained them himself, they would not have been discovered. 
The commission member who found them has since resigned from the commission. And then my second complaint, um, it was a closed session that was not on the agenda or published prior to the meeting. Once the accounting attorney entered and asked all non-commission members to leave, um, there was no addition to the agenda and there was no vote to move to the closed session. And to my knowledge, there were never minutes put produced or approved from that closed session. Um, in the response, chairman, um, the chairman of the board, Dennis Brown, did state that he believed the closed session had not occurred and that everyone who had left had left willingly. And in the minutes um, that were approved for the, the meeting following the non-closed session meeting, it did say that we were asked to leave. So that is my only statement. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Steele. Uh, Dennis Kenworth, would you like to make a comment? You've got five minutes. Sure. Um, thank you, Bonnie. There, there was no December 2022 meeting. Uh, that meeting had been canceled. We did have a meeting in J on January the 4th of 2023. I have been unable, though I have searched desperately, to find the agenda. Well, I did see the agenda because Deputy, Chief Deputy Chris Canals did find that meeting, did find the agenda. And he showed it to me. I do remember it has have, had two things on it. Minutes from the November meeting. And also, um, we were to discuss the budget. Um, the budget's due at the end of February for EMA. I still have not been able to find it. Our regular January meeting was scheduled for January the 18th. It was canceled on January the 17th, and an email went out to all commission members. So um, I apologize. I still have not been able to find those January minutes, and I have searched through every piece of paper in this office and still have not been able to find it. I, I have no idea what happened to them. So, and as far as the closed session, I did not state it was a closed session. I simply said that we were asked to leave the meeting. I was not aware that the county attorney was going to come into the meeting. It was about five minutes after our meeting was called to order. He came in, asked for everyone that was not a member of the commission to leave the meeting for a short time. And nobody said anything. We just, everybody that was not a commission member got up and left. Nobody said anything. And when he got done, we all went back into the meeting. So I never thought it was a closed session. I thought it was a meeting between an attorney and his clients. And simply that, I never even thought of it as being a closed session. So that's where, that's the way I left it. That's the way I answered the complaint. And that's still how I feel about it. So, um, I am just a secretary to that commission. I have a, I have a commission that I answer to, just like uh, the auditor and other county entities, answer, county department has answered to the board of supervisors, et cetera, et cetera. So that is how this organization is run. And if I've done anything wrong, I'm truly sorry, but. It wasn't done with any evil intentions or with any intended neglect to my duties. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Duckworth. So, May I address the board as well, please? We're, we're not sure who you are, it just says unknown. Yep, that's the story of my life. My name is Paul <laughs> Groof. Uh, my last name is spelled G-R-E-U-F-E. And I am the human resources representative for Union County. And I was present um, during this, this meeting that's being discussed. Yes, uh, Mr. Group, if you would like to, uh, I can give you five minutes to speak. Thank you. So at, the, at that meeting, um, I think to me, it's, it's pretty important in reading the acceptance order by the Iowa Public Information Board that it states that um, 
Joe Duckworth admitted that it was a closed session. Now, in talking to Joe previously, it's my understanding that that was never her intent, or it's still not her belief now that there was ever any type of a closed session. Now, as the human resources rep, um, I am not a voting member of the Emergency Management Commission. Um, I was present via Zoom at that meeting where the county attorney came in and asked that all non-voting members leave. Um, I didn't leave. So I'm an example of someone who was asked to leave but stayed because I understood it to be a request. Um, but it was certainly no mandate. It was no closed session. It was simply a request to have the non-voting members leave. Um, and again, I didn't. I stayed. So um, again, I'm not a voting member, but elected to stay in the meeting. Now, I know it's odd um, that you would ever have an open meeting where people are asked to voluntarily leave. Um, but as a human resources representative that works with counties across the state, um, it, it's odd, but in my experience, it isn't unheard of. Um, where I'll see it is oftentimes or sometimes in compensation board meetings. So the compensation board is established with Iowa Code 331.905, where it sets the wages of elected officials in county government. Um, I've been to a number of those public meetings where the compensation board will ask the the elected officials to leave the meeting so that they can discuss things now it's always a request it's never a mandate um but i just wanted to have some sort of a um a background as to what i believe happened at that meeting in emergency management so again um, it wasn't a closed session never voted to go into a closed session nobody even said the term that it was a closed session um i was asked to leave and I chose not to. And I think the same could have been done for anybody else who voluntarily chose to leave that meeting. Um, you know, my I request that if, if again, it sounds like um, the, I know that the Iowa Public Information Board asked for additional information from the board chair of that commission, the commission chair, who wrote that it was, was not a closed session. And so now to me, my fear is, is that the facts listed in the document under case number 24 FC 0013 um, seems to be in in question as to whether or not Mrs. Duckworth um, noted that it was a closed session. So my hope would be is that the board would table the decision under potentially um, additional information gathering, um, as it seems to me like that's a, a pretty big question uh, before the, the board this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Group. So, do we have any comments from the board? I don't know why, but yeah, I, I think I think we're splitting ears here about whether it's a closed session or not. I think when a board, people who are empowered, like to point it off, ask the audience to leave. I think it's a closed session. I think uh, and I don't I also want to underscore based on the comment someone made this is this board is not interested in fault it's interested in what occurred and how to get it straight uh, I think that's important so again I think staff's done a nice job moving through this and I think the recommendation is appropriate. I think training, to say the least, is probably in order, um, particularly in what a closed session is. Yeah. So, so do I understand correctly that this body in Union County Emergency Management Agency were essentially gathered in or not I don't believe it to be, I don't know, yes. So it, I fully agree with you that you can't just i mean if you if you can have a closed session pursuant to code then you make a motion to go into closed session because you're protected at that point but I, in any scenario in my head i can't get my wrapped around that you can just stop say everyone leave we're going to have a something my concern is their county attorney walked in and asked everybody to leave and so if their county attorney doesn't even know the 
chapter 22 laws on public meetings, I my red flags immediately went up because even with um, I'm on our county compensation board and elected officials are can sit in on the meeting. Uh, they can sit and listen to what we have to say about their salaries. Um, but we typically do not have it on the agenda for them to speak. So they can sit and listen and stir all they want to on how mean the compensation board is to them. But um, with any board, when you have a public meeting um, and, and the county attorney walks in and asks people to leave, that concerns me because the county attorney does not understand the laws then. And this is a public meeting. Agendas need to be published. Minutes need to be kept. I, I think there's I think there's some training that definitely needs to go on in this county. We're done with discussions on that. So unless would you like to I think we should give her Okay, Ms. Duckworth, go ahead. So, do I have permission to speak? Yes, yes, you do. Okay, thank you. Ms. So, my, my um, issue with this, the decision that was emailed to me, is that I had no control over this. So, it looks like that I closed the session of, of our board, of our commission meeting. I did not. It, no, it wasn't it was, my, no, actually, we, I don't take it that way at all. I take it that, that your county attorney came in and and cleared the room. And so that I I don't know if anybody else believes that, but I I, I don't believe that it was you that, that cleared the meeting, no. But that's the way the decision reads. I mean. I, oh, I, I don't read it that way. I'm not, I don't think the rest of the board does either. I think it's important for everyone to know that this is, a, there's not, we don't take complaints of, against individuals. Exactly. This is for the government entity. Um, and so it's finding that there was a violation of uh, chapter 21 by the government agency, um, which is what the acceptance is for, uh, with the idea that we'll work to address any deficiencies that were uh, identified through this complaint. Yes, okay. that, yes. Yeah, no, it's not. No, it's a, the, yes, the government agency is, is the. Uh, I just don't want to misconstrue that I let this. No, no not, not at all. Not at all. This is. This meeting can't. goes straight. And then when, in fact, during a commission meeting, I am merely a secretary to the commission. Yes. And that's. No and more, no less. It. We, and, we and this is Bonnie and, and Joe, I agree with you. You did not, um, you were just as surprised by I as I was at <laughs> I the was county shocked. attorney. So we'll agree. <laughs> yes. Um, so do I have, uh, thank, thank you, Ms. Duckworth. Are, are we ready for a motion? Yes, yes. I'm ready for a motion. I move approval of the acceptance order. Second. Okay. Got tied between <laughs> Joel and Joel. We'll flip a coin. What do you want, Julie? Julie, sir, first. Okay, we got Joel. Julie and Joel. Okay. Uh, do we have any other discussion? If not, I'll call for a vote. All in favor of accepting the acceptance order? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Let's go to the next one. Okay, uh, next one is Zachary, I hope I pronounce this correctly, uh, Bullich and the City of Leland. This is case number 24FC0018. In this case, Mr. Bullich alleges the uh, city is asking to charge an unreasonable fee for the production of records he requested. We made a request for meeting documents from October 2019 to December 2023, uh, copies of city council meeting recordings, copies of council oath of office and ethics, and copies of the city council insurance and bond information. Um, 
Originally, the city had to be $24 per hour for records request after talking with IPIP. Um, they did uh, revise that to the city clerk's actual wage of $20 an hour. Um, the city did estimate that it would take approximately 12 hours to produce and review these documents and another four hours to scan and copy the documents to a thumb drive. Um, Mr. Bullich disagreed that the estimated costs uh, of compiling and producing the records uh, was excessive and should not take more than two to four hours. And there is no dispute that the city is able to charge for the actual cost of compiling, scanning, and producing the records. Uh, in this case, the issue is the estimated time uh, from the city. Typically, it's difficult to, to ascertain an estimate, but in this case, the records saw at our city council meeting documents, close of office, recordings of meetings and city information, insurance information, which should be um, readily uh, retained and available and have little uh, confidential information on it. Uh, so 16 hours under these facts does seem a, a little excessive in the amount of time that's needed for completing the specific request. Um, for that, we are recommending uh, acceptance um, based on that, uh, and we will work with the parties for addressing this records request. Hey, do we have Mr. Bullich on the phone? Yes, I am here. Okay, I'm sorry if I pronounced the, the last name incorrectly. Nope, you got it right, Bullich. Okay, good. You got it right. It's a lot of All people right. get it wrong. <laughs> All right, you've got five minutes. Um, based upon this, uh, the facts of what uh, Erica had uh, stated there, um, I, I have an IT background. I'm a network administrator and stuff like this, so I'm very tech savvy and involved in the technology. Uh, the, based upon the facts, there's a rough estimate of about 500 pages to be copied, um, and they're not being copied and printed. They're just being, they, most of the pages should already be available on a electronic file um, because the minutes of testimony, the clerk types up, so they should they should be saved on the city computer after they're finalized being typed up. Um, number two, the insurance information you can receive from your insurance provider through an electronic file. There, there should be no no need for any kind of um, uh, um, review or clearing anything out that's personal or private information. And of course, the city minutes are not. There's nothing in the city minutes that's per personal or private that needs to be excluded from it. So all these documents that I've requested should already be done. But the clerks, the city stated that it has to be copied and gone through. Well, I've got a Epson printer that I bought from Walmart that I could do 500 pages with, within about two, two and a half hours. Most printers, when you look online and you even ask AI, artificial intelligence, um, you ask different websites, you different ask different IT guys, you could do about 500 pages within two and a half hours. Um, Staples in Mason City, Iowa. I spoke to a, somebody down there that does that works in that department, and they said they can have 500 pages done within within an hour and a half. So, wherefore the city is getting the estimated hour uh, or estimated time of 16 hours is absurd and has me completely flabbergasted. And I think it's a a block for me to not pay the pay the cost to have them pr produce these documents they're trying to block me and keep me from getting these documents that's all i have thank you mr village is there anybody from the city of leland who would like to speak yes. yes uh miss erski would you like to speak just unmute yourself here I'm you. There we go. Good morning, or good afternoon, actually. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I am here. Uh, my name is Donna Rispy. I'm Deputy City Clerk and Custodian of Records for the City of Leland, Iowa. Um, as Mr. Volatest stated, yes, he is asking for quite a few documents. In fact, he's asking. Um, for 51 months worth of documents from the city of Leland. Those documents, um, still I need clarification on some of them, which I have asked for on numerous occasions, and I cannot give a, an exact amount of time that it will be clarified, 
until he clarifies that needed information. Um, and on at least four occasions, I've asked him to clarify exactly what he is asking for from the city of Leland so that I can provide a better estimate for one. Um, the other item that I wanna make clear is there is some past discrepancies uh, with some of the things that Mr. Volich has said towards the city of Leland and how we have uh, not tried to work with him or we are trying to um, not supply him documents that he's requesting. That is not true. We are clearly asked him for clarification on many times. The last time he did file a complaint with your board, um, we had to have clarification again. By the time it got to resolved and dismissed, we gave him the personal information of myself and for the other city, one of the other city employees that he asked for. Um, now he is going back, and those were his exact words when he gave us this um, request. He was going back to April of last year when he requested some documents. At that time when he made that same request, I filled out a form that I give every time to every individual who asks, this is what I need from you to clarify exactly what you're looking for. We never received any responses. We have never received any response until we get to this point and still I'm asking for clarification. Again, part of what he is asking for is inspect and copy. That's what it states on his request. Then it goes into, I want things put on a thumb drive. We can do that. We're willing to do that. The items he is requesting are on hard copy only. Yes, they are put on our computer. Yes, they are sent to the newspaper. But the documents that he is requesting that would have our signature on or the mayor's signature on saying these are the final copies are on hard copy only. They will have to be scanned unless he's willing to take the documents that I do have on the computer that do not have a signature on them. Those are the computer, those are the items that are actually sent to the newspapers. He has not clarified that either with us. So estimate is all I can give. We have lowered our fee. I do have two individual wages that I am paid. I am paid one set fee as a custodial of records. And then I am also paid a different fee or a different job title, which is deputy city clerk. We, on our estimates, gave it for the custodial of records. We have since lowered that. We have tried to make adjustments and yet he keeps coming back with other items. We want to work with Mr. Volich. We are trying to work with Mr. Volich like we have done in the past. We need clarification. We can only give an estimate. I do not know how long it's going to take to scan 51 months worth of minutes, let alone resolutions and ordinance changes. Then he wants, and it states that he wants information from city council members, oaths of office, employees, and other people working for the city. I have asked. Is this for from October of 2019 or is this for now? I still am not getting clarification. So I cannot give him an exact amount of time, nor can I give him an, anything but an estimate. We are asking that like the time before this be dismissed on the fact of we can only work so much with him. We cannot, nor anybody else, can tell the city of Leland what they should pay their employees to do a job. We, have, we are trying to work to make this reasonable, but if a person is asking for that amount of documents and is not expecting to pay for them, that is not our fault. That is that individual's fault, not the city's. Thank you very much, Ms. All right, comments from the board? I do have a follow-up if possible. 
Um, actually, we're going to look at comments from the board right now. Okay, that's fine. Does anybody have any questions for either party? I, I think we could become effective mediators of this. I was just thinking it might be challenging to mediate, but that's the reason that to give it a shot. I agree with Joe. If those two people are right there, I guess you have to stop all. Okay. Get resolved and break out this thing. Yeah. Either way, it's resolved, right? Do I have a motion and a second? I move to accept the acceptance order. Second. Joel and EJ, any other discussion? I'll ask for a vote. All in favor of accepting the acceptance order? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion accepted. All right. Barry has uh, yeah, the lead. Yeah, I do that. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Bullich and uh, Ms. Ayersby. Thank you for All your right. time. Uh, the next one is Charles Nocera and Iowa Department of Administrative Services. All right. Um, this is a revised dismissal order. This is the case um, 24 FC 0020 was before the board last month. Um, in this case, Mr. Masera is uh, looking for a, he's made a public records request to the Iowa Department of Administrative Services asking for data on the higher age of all state employees. He's received this from other states and would like the same from Iowa. Department of Administrative Services says that it does not track higher age or have records that reflect the higher age. Um, and in if they were obligated to respond to this request, they would be responsible for creating new records. Um, the higher date, um, so the in order to get the higher age, there would be a requirement to uh, determine the higher date of a public employee, which is clearly uh, a public record under 22.711A2. However, an employee's birthday is a confidential record. And so essentially the question is whether or not uh, because the uh, Department of Administrative Services has this information in a database, what to what extent are they required to utilize existing data in the database to create uh, uh, and answer the question for Mr. Nocera about the higher age? A um, couple things to, to keep in mind. Uh, the Iowa Court, Supreme Court has stated that if underlying communications are confidential, uh, creating a list from that confidential information um, is not required. Uh, so creating a list of the birth dates um, would, would not be required under 22.7. Uh, the, the specific issue is uh, whether or not Iowa law requires a government body to perform what would be essentially a customized search or manipulation of data um, from their database to specifically provide the data sought by Mr. Nocera. Uh, again, this is not something uh, that has uh, a clear answer under Iowa law and is a, a question that a lot of different states have looked at. Um, there is uh, an attorney general opinion um, back from 1996 trying to struggle with that issue. Uh, our electronic records have um, expanded exponentially since that time uh, with no clear answers on that as well. Um, so looking at this, uh, as a level um, and uh, previous requirements under Chapter 22 that does not require any government body entity to create a record or to specifically answer a question posed um, requiring that a government body manipulate their data and from the database to create a, a separate data point from the information they have would be an extension of Chapter 22 um, that uh, greatly expand uh, the requirements for government entities as more and more information is uh, electronic. Uh, and so the recommendation in this um, essentially is that uh, this be dismissed uh, and not 
expand Chapter 22 to require manipulation and uh, calculations of information that is not that might be based on data that the government entity has that is not a separate uh, data set uh, that is included within their electronic records. Um, again, that's, this is a decision for the board, but that's a recommendation. All right. Um, Mr. Nocera, would you like to comment? Well, I can, but I believe that the board was looking at this law in more detail over the last month. And I guess I need to know, and I guess primarily they were trying to see why current ages are being calculated, but higher ages are not. So before I get into my three solutions, I was wondering if the board could give me sort of an update of what they were thinking when they were researching this for the last month. So Mr. Nasera, the, the research is what's in this dismissal order on the law. Um, you have sent an email saying that there are current ages somewhere on iowa.gov or uh, that is outside of this particular complaint. Um, so the research was done on uh, AG opinions and the current state of the law in answering the specific question raised by your complaint. All right, so let me go with my first solution here then. I am volunteering as a free public service to calculate the higher age, to count by higher age, and then graph that head count with no personalized info being revealed. Clearly, I'm going to be part of this higher age solution. Along with Des Moines city government, who provided me the higher ages this last month. So I'm not compelling anybody in Iowa state government to be part of this higher age solution. You can keep it hidden in Iowa state government. So I would like to have a review next month to see if this idea is feasible, this solution. You can even start a security clearance if needed. Then we can move to solutions two and three. So that's my solution right now is that, you know, I'm volunteering to do this. I have other states that provide me the birth year and the higher year. And in 30 minutes, I can subtract those two, count by higher age and produce a graph. And I would like to do the same for Iowa if Iowa state government doesn't want to do it. Thank you, Mr. Nasira. You bet. Well, do we have uh, Mr. Reckman on from uh, IDAS? Yes, I'm here. Um, I'd just like to say I appreciate the board's time on this matter. Uh, we don't have anything additional to add, but would ask that the board approve the revised dismissal order. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments from the board? Oh, I have comments. <laughs> Eric and I have talked about this. I think that we're kind of heading down the wrong path in handling computer records. And I want to remind the board the definition of public records under Chapter 22 is very broad. It includes all records, documents, tape, or other information stored or preserved in any media. So a computer full of data is one big pile of public records. And it always has to be programmed to get anything out. The example this is setting is that Nobody can request any information from computer data that hasn't been requested before. Um, and I don't think that's the law, nor should it be. I don't think it's that it hasn't been requested, it's that it isn't a data point in the information. And, and maybe it's that I'm not sophisticated about computer. I don't know how important it is that it be a data point. The information is in there with the right program, it to be spit out. 
I think the definition is so broad that the information itself is a public record, but it's an issue of programming. And I don't know that it has to be programmed previously to be accessible in a public request. And Erica will get a feeling of deja vu because I went through this with her. Um, for example, DNR probably has information on every state park in Iowa, but maybe nobody's run the data of how many acres are, are devoted to state parks in Iowa. And by the reasoning of this dismissal order, nobody could get that unless DNR had requested it and the data had been processed into an itemization of how many, how many acres total. And I think that's contrary to the public records law. And, and I would just say, Julie, um, and I, um, I think that if somebody asks how many acres there are in state public parks, they would be able to provide a list of all of the acreages for each of them that people could compile themselves to add, but they wouldn't be required to specifically run the addition themselves to provide that number because that is essentially requiring them to use their data to answer a question and create a document. The list of all of the acreages that are there for the DNR is a data, is a list that would have to be provided because it is data in that that they have already. Uh, making them do that additional calculation to answer a question of how many there are, if they don't already have a document or they don't already have that set up, I think is different. Requiring a list, extrapolating information from that data that is already programmed, already kept in that database um, is, is what I think is required. Doing that additional answering of question, doing any kind of research to answer a question or having to create additional uh, calculations to answer a question, I think is a broadening of public records simply because that is there and could be programmed to answer that. I think that's, that's the distinction um, that I think is, is expanding it uh, in Mr. Nelsera's request. Well, I think we're importing the concept of you know, paper records. You don't have to create a record. That's true. But I just don't think it applies to computer data. It clearly is already defined in Chapter 22 as public information. You have to program it. If the DNR wants that information, they can do so. It shouldn't be relevant whether they've requested that information or not. It should be accessible to anybody who wants to pay the programming fee to get that out. So if people are uncomfortable with this case, because you have to rely on information that would be confidential to get a computer program to run, then I'd much prefer that we have a dismissal order based on administrative discretion and take some additional time to ponder how you deal with public information in a computer. The data is clearly a public record by definition. When you're going to, you should, if somebody pays the programming cost, be able to give them what they want. It's a little bit of a complication here that part of how you run the calculation depends on the confidential record that isn't going to be revealed just the, just the end. You're going to have to ask a computer through programming to put data together. That's not unexpected. And I think it would be a real step back in public records law to say you can't get anything out of a huge pile of data that somebody didn't already request before. It's not, it's not like paper records. So I, it's, I guess I do what you for. If you want to dismiss it, I don't quarrel with that, but make it on an alternative ground. Use your administrative discretion and take more time to sort out how people get to public information that's public. So here's my, here's my, devil's advocate on this, I guess. So if you've got, with the data that's there, you could have a database that goes to Ivers that shows everybody's um, birth year and their higher year, because part of it, it, I think part of this could even be available because don't we still have in the state of Iowa like the rule of 88 or the rule of 92? So no. the years of service, it's already there, to be quite honest, because when you're looking at your hypers to be able to retire, it is your 
age, plus your years of service. Now, when I was there, it was rule of 92. I think it's rule of 88. Is that correct? Okay, so rule of 88. So your age plus your years of service equals 88, and you can retire, get full retirement with diapers. So somewhere in state government, we have this information because it's already determined based on the IPERS information that is out there. And I would assume it would be the same. I don't know if it's with the Board of Regents, but um, so somewhere we have to have this information because otherwise they couldn't pay IPERS out. So it's there, but how do we get it? Um, how do we get it out? Because it, I mean, it is public. I mean, it is public information. I'm not sure it would all be there for people who are retirement age. If you've been hired and you've been in a state agency for five years and you're. But, but it also, now it used to be, I don't know this, when I was there 30 some odd years ago, you had to work five years. And when you were on your sixth, sixth year, you were best in the night Seven years. Oh, it's seven years now. Okay, so well, that's right. So yeah, it, but but we're also talking about Department of Administrative Services. We're not talking about papers. No, but that same information that DOS provides to, to IPERS is there. But that still leaves us with your, under the public records law. You have an obligation to pull out public information that's defined as a public record by the definition. It's such a broad one applied to computers, it's sitting on all this data that's public, why is it a barrier that you have to program it to take it out? And you're not going to give it to anyone unless somebody has asked for it before. That doesn't but make sense. To but me. it's already there because the higher date and the age, they're all in there. They're all in there. But you don't want to reveal the birth date because that is no, you you're can right. just do a simple calculation. Yeah. And you can, okay. So it, my, my swan's on. But still, if you want to dismiss it, do it on a ground that doesn't come back to haunt you when you deal with public records laws applied to computer data. I thought about this all month. So when that, I really, truly do believe that that information is already there, and it would not take much to be able to pull it out. So, I mean, I guess. Uh, this is not, I think this is a much bigger issue than just this. It is. And and I, I think that uh, it's going to take a while to sort it out. Um, I think there's a lot of questions. You know, there's some states that have some judicial opinions on it. There's some states that haven't taken uh, written laws on it. But a lot of them is kind of an unknown question. And so I don't think this is something that's going to be resolved today. Um, so I guess the question is, how you want to handle this complaint um, under Julie's recommendation of administrative discretion or to hold this until there's time to do that extensive research and policy decisions by the board. I'm fine for the latter. I mean, my concern is so then anytime they go into a city and they have something in a database, they have to start um, not just providing records or printing off something or um, creating a list of something that's already in their database, but now they have to start manipulating and answering and doing quantifications and things like that because they have that. Maybe that's what's required, but. Um, yeah. No, I, I suppose I, I, yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm just, I'm, not, you know, I'm trying to figure out if the room the couch the language to be very, very specific, so it doesn't lead into other requests. I, I don't know if that's possible. I'm not that smart, but. So the uh, birthday would be considered confidential. 
under Iowa law is higher than considered confidential. No, it's, it's something that has to be. So I have confidential, not confidential. Put those two together, you create a record. So that's what we're getting to. Is we are asking to create a record that does not exist. It does exist. According to Department of Administrative Services without doing a calculation. The right. data is in there. The data is there, and I agree with that. I think it's there. What what does it open up if, because the way I look at it is, hey, if the DS wanted to provide, be Iowa nice and provide it great, we solve it, we move on. But I don't feel like we have the authority to compel them to create a record. That's the question. And that's the big question. And that's, that, and that's where I, that's where I come back. And that's why I was thinking about this, because I was at the point where, nope, we shouldn't do that. However, technically, it is already there because of the retirement system. I think you can argue my conclusion. That is the conclusion. They have to go through the process to get the AMC. They, they have to go through programming to pull anything out. Right. I don't, and it, I, I don't agree with that. even having the background of computers that have creates some data set that sits in the computer in the future. I think it's all a question of programming. Because the definition of public records is so broad, I think it gives the requester who has to pay for it the right to get to the computer data, that's how the state's chosen to keep that information. And if you pay the programming cost and the outcome isn't confidential under the law and what he's asking for it wouldn't be, then you need to run the data. If people need more time to ponder computer records, I guess I'd rather we just dismiss it at administrative discretion for that reason I want it to be want to take more time. To that. But see, that's the key. They have to pay for programming yes. in order to provide it. But that's no different than paying the cost of Xeroxing, right? It's stored in a computer, so you're not Xeroxing something, but you have to pay for the programming to pull it out. And that's part of what those opinions that deal with what kind of computer costs can you charge with people are getting data. But in those opinions, they were just pulling data that was already there and putting it in electronic form. This is, if, if they were just pulling the list of the information, they wouldn't be able to charge. They, I mean, if they were copying it, yes, there's a copy charge, but if they're just pulling a list of all of the higher date, higher dates, all of the data birth, assuming it's not confidential, they wouldn't necessarily be able to charge for pulling it from that database because they chose to put it in there. Um, again, I, I just think this is a big, big issue. Um, and could result in, in, I don't know, um, expanding the scope of what's required. Because you are, you are creating documents they don't have. You're requiring a program no. yeah. instruction well, to get the data out. Right. You'd have to do that if you just want a list of higher dates. You'd have to tell the computer what you want in a programming request, and it comes out. But then, then it calculates something from one document which happens to be confidential. I think bothers Erica more than me. And in that case, I'd say dismiss it in your administrative discretion. But don't slam the door on people's right to get data out of a big pile of bits and bytes of information if they pay the programming cost. Then I think they're entitled to my definition of the 22. Um, Erica, could you further what you just said a minute ago regarding your concern that this opens the door? So my, my concern is that because so much is in an electronic form and first i see this as i agree that if if there's data of the higher date they would have to provide that because they have that in their data that's a data point that they enter if if birth dates assuming they weren't confidential is a data point they have they would have to provide a list of that the the issue is that he's wanting them to take that data and then do a calculation to create separate data. And so that creates 
is basically answering a question or creating a new document through that calculation. Whereas as we have more government, everything is electronic now. So are we expanding public records to not just, since you have a database and you can do a calculation, you need to start, you have to give them the opportunity to pay for programming to answer any of these research questions or answer any of these things because you have the data, you now have to create these answers from the data that you have. And it's it's kind of expanding the, the records. So, I mean, so then you're, you're concerned that um, you wouldn't have the authority to, it's not clear in the, in the law. That, we should, the law is not clear about how to handle all of this in data that's electronically stored by government entities. Okay, so, so how do we fix that? Well, yeah. and, but see, that, I mean, that, but any time, so it's the same thing with, um, you know, salary ranges and things like that. That data is there. And you're looking at, you know, in fiscal year 2015, somebody made this amount of money in fiscal year 2020, somebody made this amount of money. So, yeah, she can give them the data points and somebody can calculate, you know, the dollar amount, the percentage amount and do that. However, because there's one piece that's confidential and one piece that is not. So, you know, we can spit out you know, higher dates, but between those two points, the data is there because I, to be, I'm really stuck on this. We already have it because it's got to be provided for retirement. And so I'm having a hard time, or is it just hypers that has that information? Maybe we should ask Mr. Redman if that's information that they have. It's got its hand up. Yeah, to respond to that issue, DAS does not provide that information to IPERS. When an employee wants to retire, they have to go to IPERS and have that conversation directly with IPERS. We don't provide, you know, the rule of 88 type data um, to that department. So maybe DAS isn't the agency that should be looking at this. Maybe this is something that should go to IPERS instead. That'll not be close to what he's asking for because I, I don't think IPERS is going to have that for somebody who's nowhere near retirement age. And then I am willing really to pull IPERS out. Excuse me, I hold on, I'm still speaking because you're pulling IPERS money out of every paycheck. That's true. And so they have to have that information when it goes into, I mean, when it goes into the system. So every paycheck, a portion of your pay goes to IPERS. So every employee that's IPERS covered. But it doesn't matter how old you are, you get a paycheck pay into IPERS. Right. So, if, at the, the bottom line to me is if the state wants to know this, if they want to know the higher date for employees for the last, I don't know, two years, because they look at their age biases or anything, they can get it. Um, why are we closing the door to somebody else getting it if they do? The, they pay for the computer programming? It's just a big pile of public information. But where is that information coming from? Is it coming from does uh, DOS provide it? Or who provides that data if they're looking at age discrimination? So like well, if they're training. interested in DOS hires, then DOS would have it in there. And if the governor's office wants to know the age of hire for employees for the last two years, they can run a computer program and tell. And so then that would be a public document. Right. Yeah, but why does the public have to wait until somebody decides to ask that, for it that, before they can get it out of the computer? Right. It's all programming. That's all a big pile waiting there for someone to program. And that's what I'm worried about slamming the door shut up, people being able to access public data because nobody's asked for it. So back to the state parks, nobody asked what the total acreage is before. Um, so that means you can't get it until somebody at DNR or somebody else requests it and it gets programmed. I think it's, and this may be again my admitted lack of knowledge about computers. I'm not sure it creates a little pool of, of data. It's all bits that are sorted. So if you want to know the total acreage, it'll sort it and spit it out. I don't know why it wouldn't do that for a public records requester too. Okay. Um, 
But actually, my suggestion of an alternative ground for dismissal was my attempt to be reasonable on the last day. So I believe I believe that I can solve this short-term and long-term problem. Can, all right, well, the, this is the board discussion now. Um, but I mean, this is this is my comment before I was not inclined to do this. However, the more you think about it, it is, and I think Julie's got a good point. Any agency that wants this information, they might call DOS and say, I need a report, run. And DOS creates it. So, what is the difference? And and I I get it because we're talking about the creation of a report. However, the data is there, and so what is the difference between, um, you know, the Department of Transportation, Department of Education, asking for information when the information is there? And yes, it's it's a programming, it's a formula. That's all it is. It's, it's a formula. So, what is the difference between typing in B minus A equals this gives you the higher date or higher age? I, I think we have to remember we're talking, I mean, there's data. Yes, data is there, but we're also talking about public records. If I have a conversation with EJ, nothing compels me to write that down and create a public document. That information is still there, our conversation still occurred, but nothing compels me under chapter 22 to document that conversation. Having the data out there in a, pro, in a computer that other government entities could ask for then would create a public document, but just requiring the government entity to, because they have this data, then create documents when there's a request or a, a somebody wants as um, a research done or an answer. I think that is an incredible extension of what a public record is. But I don't find that alarming. What I find alarming is you don't get it unless somebody asks for it first. It's still a, a state agency or a, a public and, official asks for it first. Why are we yeah. making the public be secondary to somebody requesting that data and all this public public bits are programmed to give out the information that somebody decided to store in a computer. I think it's left in part, I think the fact that it involves data burden like that, but that bothers me maybe more than it does someone else. But yeah, I think that and maybe Eric, let me ask this, but you know, are you comfortable with Julie's suggestion? Dismissal of the matter of question, I understand. Well, and the could express the state that we want more time to look at how to handle how access to computer data is handled under the public records law. I um, think it, yeah, I think it's an ex I think it, I think there should be a lot more um, review of it. Um, I think, you know, it, the question is do you want to address I don't think we're going to answer the question today. <laughs> I think that we've made that clear. Um, the question is, do we want to address this complaint? Um, this complaint does have specific facts that it would rely on confidential data. So with that, the board could make a decision on this case without deciding the bigger um, question. And in that, um, they could make that you know, dismiss for administrative discretion with the requirement that there be additional um, research and development of perhaps an advisory opinion or, or more information about how we handle this, because this is a question that's going to come up again, I think. Yeah, I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable. Well, can I guess you where you want to go? Yeah, not exactly where I want to go, but it avoids cutting off access to public bits of data because nobody has requested it or generated a program yet. Are we at a point where I can just make a question? Hold on, because so I get it. We don't have to force somebody to create a record. 
However, the data is already there as a record. And part of it is confidential, part of it is us. And that's that's the holdup, is because the data we do have records there. The records are there. It's the point of one piece is confidential, one piece is not. So we're not creating a new record, we're just utilizing the records that are there to provide an output that would be a public record. We're creating an output that is that is based, we're creating an output that isn't necessarily a data point they have. It's adding, is requiring calculations. Creating is the word I have a problem with. We are creating. See, I'm sold with Julie now. I was, I, I was with you last month, but what, the more I got to thinking about this, when you're, I mean, because when you're looking at it, I mean, seriously, because it is, it's one of those things that we know the data is there. And it's data that the state put in. The and, and you're right, it's the data that the state put into the computer. So each one of those data points is actually a record. So all you're doing is manipulating, and, and I get it. So if you're in, if, you want with all of those records that's there um if you want college graduation dates well that's not necessarily there so that would be creating a new record but we already have this information it's just manipulating it it's putting in a formula to create the number that's the only way to get it that's the only way to get it out of it Um, well, I guess we could find out if I make a motion to change the dismissal order to dismiss on grounds of administrative discretion. I guess in part because it's a confidential data and they want to spend more time analyzing access to computer records. Make that a motion. Can you do that? On grounds of administrative discretion because it relies on confidential data. Um, both, both oh. confidential data, but also public looking data. at how the access the public has to computer information. I can help you guys here. I no, mean, I can help you guys. This is all, this is all more discussion. Yeah, well, I can help you. I mean, I have a lot of experience with this across states and cities and provinces. Thank you for thank you for your comments on that. But this is on the board is making a making a motion on this. Okay, all right, mm -hmm. I can help you. Can Can you repeat the last part of her motion um, regarding the go forward? Um, I have uh, on dismissed on grounds of administration. Administrative discretion because relies on confidential data, and the board uh, wants additional time to look at um, access to computer data as a public record. So, so the intent of the second part is that the board would deliberate on something like so that. So there would be some additional legal research, extensive legal research, and then the board would come on another case yeah. on another case or an advisory opinion or something. We would have more knowledge of how to handle one. If we give an advisor, we also. Yeah. I would rush into an advisor. Head of the state. We're going to say, wow. We're going to call you. Thank you, Carol. Okay, that's a motion. Is there a second? Also. All right, I have a motion and a second. Do we have any further board discussion? If not, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yes. Okay. I move the board relatively out. Oh, not entirely. Oh, can we take a quick little break? Yes. Yes, I'm going to take a break. Get a cookie. All right. Everybody, uh, we're going to take a, a quick little break. Five minutes. Do, do I just stay on? This um, is Daniel, do I just stay on? Yeah, you can stay on. We're just uh, going to take a five minute break, but everything is going to okay. stay on. I'm just going to mute. Okay, thank you.
Next case, Cameron Crumley and City of Grandview. All right, in this case, Ms. Crumley alleges the City Council has adopted a consent agenda for city bills, so there is no public records regarding bills paid or income generated. She alleges another individual requested a copy of the bills. This was not provided to her at the time. She also alleges the Grandview Community Club held a meeting to discuss the club's agenda for the year, including business directly related to the city and city council members attend the meetings, even though they're not members of the club. Three council members responded to this complaint. The responses were all pretty similar. They stated Ms. Crumley is former mayor of the city. During her time as mayor, the city implemented a consent agenda to streamline meetings. This included approval of the city's bills. They stated that there was no request for records at the February 12th meeting, uh, just a general dissatisfaction with using a consent agenda after complaining about the consent agenda, the individual left the building. Uh, the compa complaint appears to be that by failing to provide copies of the bills paid as part of the consent agenda during the meeting, the city violated Iowa Code Chapter 22. Neither Iowa Code 21 nor 22 requires that council packets and documents be provided to the public as a matter of right. Um, if a request is made, the city must respond, of course, but it's difficult to determine from this complaint whether a request was made person who alleged to have made a request is not the person who made the complaint. The city does publish all their bills approved within the consent agenda in the walk alone morning sun in addition to the rest of the minutes of the meeting. Uh, as far as the community club, the public private collaboration between the non government entity and the city alone is beyond the jurisdiction of IPIB um, without an allegation of a chapter 21 violation. The complaint appears to be collaboration in the community for events and that a few but less than a majority of the city council members may occasionally attend these meetings or be involved as volunteers for the club. This is not a violation of the complaint. Um, basically, a recommendation of dismissal, uh, consent agenda that uh, does not appear to violate Chapter 21 or 22. There's no Chapter 21 violation regarding the Grandview Community Club Easter and Fourth of July events. It's uh, on there, just the we just provide comments. Um, comments. Um, so you can see the comments that we provided. They were sent, uh, afterwards. yeah. Um, is there anybody from the city of Grandview on that would like to respond? Yeah, this is uh, Jason Garrison, Mayor of Grandview. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes, we can. Uh, we'll give you five um, minutes if you'd like to respond. Yep. And so um, with this, I um, I just want to say, you know, the city of Grandview we had quite a few um, transformation this year with, you know, new mayor in my position and some new city council members. And we're absolutely committed to um, fostering a culture of collaboration and transparency within our group. So we got a bunch of new folks on um with in in this case um I, I we don't feel like there was a request made to see um those documents the meeting was over and it was very contentious um i felt like the best thing for everybody was just to um the, you know to be done with the conversations because they were going nowhere um that was beneficial to the community so i just want to put that out there that we're 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 where the open meetings law we talk about it quite a bit um and we make sure that everybody including our new council members um are aware of that just to make sure that we don't have any issues so thank you mr garrison right, thank you session. does anybody have anything to say or if not i'll ask for a motion in a second approval of the dismissal order. Second. Julie, second Joel. Any other discussion by the board? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
This was the order passes. Um, Dan Nederton and I'm sorry. Neutron. Neutron. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good. Uh, South Central Regional Airport Agency. This is case number 24 FC 0026. Uh, in this case, Mr. Neutron alleged that um, the South Central Regional Airport Agency failed to unmute the telephone system to allow inbound callers to provide public comment during a meeting. Uh, he alleges he's uh, had multiple past examples of trying to provide input in 2017 and 2019. Um, in response, the airport agency provided a copy of the minutes of the meeting which showed two individuals attended in person and two appeared by phone. No comments were made during the meeting in the minutes. Um, Ms. Smith, uh, who is the city clerk of Pella, who operates the phone for the meeting, provided a sworn affidavit that stated the conference call lines are not automatically muted. She did not manually mute the lines. She also stated that if a line is being muted, there's an automated notice to the caller they're muted. Um, and because no lines were muted, there was no need to unmute anyone. Um, while nothing in Iowa Code Chapter 21 requires public comment to be allowed, if the airport agency provided an opportunity for public comment, it needs to allow the public to participate during that period with reasonable rules and limits. Uh, Mr. His complaint is, is that he believes he was unable to provide public comment during the airport agency meeting because his phone was not unmuted. The evidence provided by the airport agency for sworn affidavit is that no telephone lines were muted by Ms. Smith, who controlled the conference call. So there was no impediment created by the airport agency to him providing a comment during that portion of the meeting. Um, based on the fact that there's no evidence provided showing their actions prevented him from providing a public comment by telephone at the meeting on March 7, 2024, it's recommended a, a dismissal. There is a um, response by um, Mr. Nutrin um, that was provided to the board as well. I don't know if he's was going to be on. I don't know if he is. Yes, Dan Newton's on the line. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, you've got five minutes. If okay, you'd like thank to you very comment. much. Yes, Ms. Beckley, thank you very much for the uh, chance to comment and thank you for flexibility with my non traditional work schedule for providing inputs. I appreciate that. And just a note it sounds like someone there knows how to say Neutron. Somebody's familiar with the name, so uh, that's interesting. I'm not going to rehash my comments other than if uh, other than noting if uh, five items had in fact occurred, I would have been able to provide input. That's that's one part of the evidence. Second part of the evidence is I in the claim I use the word unmute, which is an abbreviation of the exact comment that Ms. Smith said in uh, her section number nine. You have been muted by the host, so I knew I was muted. And yes, it's my knowledge because I heard the statement point of note calling into this particular telecon. When I, and I'm not sure if you folks have done it, but when you call in, it said the first automated message you get is your phone line has been muted. Dial star six to unmute your line. So I did. I'm able to talk to you folks. For this SDRA meeting, to my knowledge, there is no electronic hands up. The caller cannot unmute the line. The line is muted automatically by the, uh, or mainly by the, uh, the, the individual managing the inbound call. So there's two bits of evidence right there of the problem. I won't, I will not rehash the rest of my notes. You can read them. I assume that you've already read them. And uh, I'm standing by for any questions that you have. Thank you. Um, do we have anybody from the? Uh, yep. Thank you. I'm sorry. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. I'm here to uh, Amy Beatty on behalf of the South Central Regional Airport Agency. I'm here to answer any questions that you would have, but as um, set out in the affidavit of the city clerk who's handling the matter. There, there is no indication on her end that that anything was muted. That would be something that she would have had to do. And she said, and said out in her affidavit that she did not. 
in addition, as stated, um, the agency goes up above and beyond what is required by the code and that we do allow public comments. And on top of that, we will continue to allow people to call in even after COVID. So there's, we've got over and above what is required by law and by no means did the city clerk or the agency in any way do anything to discourage someone from talking. There was clearly an offer made one of the persons who was there had decided that he, or it specifically mentioned he was not going to make any comments. So, again, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. This is Dan Luther. May I make a response? I, I'm no. Uh, we're going to talk to the board now for board comments. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any comments? Uh, if no comments, I'll take a motion and a second. I'll move dismissal. Approval of the dismissal order. I have a motion. Do I have a second? <laughs> second. By Julie, really second by Joel. Uh, Brett, could you let him answer what I'm going to I will. You can have that table to vote issues, or no, we don't have a quorum for that. Um, so we'll have to, we will have to table this till next month. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't think about that. Just a second. That's okay. We'll have to table this until next month. So do I have to change your lack of quorum? Lack of quorum. Yeah. <laughs> We no, we can't. We'll have, we'll have to table this one until next month. Well, sorry, sure. okay. it wasn't even a thing about that one. We don't have a quorum on this one. Sorry, that, so we'll have to table it until next month. So, sorry about that. The, that's right. You, you, uh, the board members are having a discussion, so yeah. the, on the audio, it's a little muffled. Can you please repeat and summarize? So we have an individual who needs to recuse, so we only have board, me board, me board members. We need five. For a quorum, so we cannot vote on this as a board on this issue. So we have to review it next month when we have um, uh, enough individuals who are can vote, vote on it. Okay, understood. So no, so no decision is made. Oh, we have another one. All right, Lynn Sherry and the City of Ute. Uh, this is uh, Ms. Sherry versus City of Ute, case number 24FC0030. Ms. Sherry alleges that the minutes from January 10, 2024, failed to include the voting of each member on the question of holding a closed session. She also alleges the minutes show Miller reported as an I vote uh, instead of uh, Council Member Pittman. In response, the, cop, the city provided a copy of amended minutes with the previous errors corrected. The amended minutes state the city went into closed session pursuant to Federal Code 21.51 to discuss strategy with legal counsel, um, et cetera. The vote was all eyes with the unanimous vote just would have met the two-third threshold to enter the closed session. The amended minutes also corrected the name of the council member from Miller to Piven as the minutes have been amended to correct. Include the corrected information. Any violation of Chapter 22 has been remedied. Uh, therefore, um, it's recommended dismissal that errors and omissions have been addressed. Ms. Murray, are you on the phone? Uh, anybody from the City of Butte? Any board discussion? I'll take a motion. Yes. Second. Just yes. Approval of the dismissal order. Okay. All right. Julie Nijik. All right. Uh, any other board discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Dismissal order passes. The last case. All right. This is case number 24, SC0028. In this case, um, Danny Jensen, 
Jensen filed a formal complaint alleging Fort Dodge Police Department violated Iowa Code uh, Chapter 22. He states he was denied public records by the Fort Dodge Police Department and other records were deleted. Um, Captain Hansen of the Fort Dodge Police Department provided a response as in regards to the deleted body camera, uh, body worn camera footage um, requested. They have previously done a review of why that camera footage does not exist. And they found that Officer Samuelson did not log into the car camera video system, so it defaulted to a different officer at the end of the incident because he was not logged in as himself um, because of classification um, of the other officer. The retention rules for the video deleted the office system from at March 16, 2022. The second issue is um, that Mr. Jansen was has been told by the police department um, how to request the video and uh, the cost for that. He hasn't followed through on that. Uh, the department is currently communicating with the law firm who represents Mr. Jensen, and they have been working on a uh, request for the video, and many of them have already been sent to him. There's one video still outstanding, but they are working with the firm to provide that uh, through the details of that. Um, because the body camera footage was uh, deleted from the system um, uh, based on just the, the way the system was set up, it's considered harmless error. The other video records requests are being provided to Mr. Jensen through his attorney. It appears the issues of this complaint are being resolved um, based on this. There's recommending dismissal. Okay. Mr. Jensen is on the phone. All right, Mr. Jensen, if you'd like to speak, uh, you can have Hi. five minutes. Yes, hello. Um, my name is Danny Jensen. I am a disabled business owner from California. I was there with my senior citizen mother, who's now dead. Um, we were there to see my daughter for three weeks for her graduation and her birthday and Christmas. Um, and I had just paid a couple of days before for three weeks in this hotel. And the officers, um, when I first requested the body cam, because the officer lied in his police report, um, they told told me, okay, well, I have to pay for it. And at the time, my uh, caregiver had just died from that trip to Iowa to see my daughter. COVID pneumonia killed her. And I didn't have anybody. And it took like seven, eight months to get another caregiver to help me out with things and everything. And I reached out. I have emails galore i kept all my emails i've recorded all my conversations with the officers the chief the the lieutenant and um and i had requested uh i i had to get an attorney because i put in requests after they told me then uh late last year i put in requests for it and they wouldn't reply to me i over and over weekly called and asked to speak to the chief or the lieutenant no one will return my calls i finally had to get an attorney the attorneys reached out to them they're claiming they can't give my attorney the underage person that was involved uh statement because he's underage that man that that person who attacked me admitted in his statement to the officer that he had a pair of gold brass knuckles, but they were fake and he didn't use them in the fight because he didn't need to. He was going boxing with his boys. That makes it premeditated. That makes multiple felonies that he committed. The officer put in his police report that there, his hands were empty, but I have photographs showing gold objects in two of the man's hands where they were hitting me. Now, um, the excuse for the body cam i have emails all the way from january of 22 and this happened in december of 21 where um lieutenant or more officer moore had spoke with officer samson jr about it uh the camp uh the body cam and everything and he said go ahead you can give it to me and they had it and then i couldn't buy it and so i down the road filed complaints about the fact that the officer lied in the police report about their hands being empty and put that i uh, i was the aggressor even though it was four men that surrounded me on camera and they still have not sent anything to my attorney's office my attorneys have been calling repeatedly to get a uh tracking number for this package that they sent 
And I don't know what all evidence they're sending, but the most important stuff, they're not. And the fact that officers, good old boys, can, can just cover up for each other when someone screws up, there needs to be some kind, something fixed with that and overhauled because in California, we got an internal affairs. We got a whole department that's not connected to the police, not their boss, not their friend. It's a completely different department. This is something I want to be done in Iowa. And I want to know, is, is it legal for them to withhold the statements made by the assailant because he was under age? They can wobble his voice or whatever, not just not give me a statement because it's in his statement. He admitted to it. And the officer put that his hands were empty and I was the aggressor. Four against one is a gang assault. Two of them had brass knuckles and I have it on video. And I'm still waiting for them to send the copy they have of the security footage because the copy that I have was a copy of a copy. And I just was able to get still shots, frame shots. And if I can get the original, I can send it to my attorney. will send it to a videographer who will get frame by frame and show detailed the gold brass knuckles they were holding that the officer claimed they didn't have. I'm very upset. I've been fighting this almost three years. All right. Thank my you, disabled Mr. mom, the officer, uh, my disabled you, mom Mr. had to. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Your, your time is up. Yeah. Do we have anybody from the Fort Dodge Police Department who would like to speak? Don't have anybody um, support discussion. Yeah, that's what I've been getting from I, them too, sir, and my attorneys hey, can't. Sir. Mr. Jensen, we're yeah. going to start the board discussion now. Thank you. Okay, I'll mute. Do we have any board discussion on this? Does, does he have another lawsuit? It sounds like he's got attorneys that are involved as well. My understanding from writing this up was that um, his department was working with his attorney on these, these issues. So I don't know what kind of suit it is, if it's civil serve, or if it's criminal. He's got no access access beyond our jurisdiction. Yeah. So. I don't know if there's another a lawsuit or he just has an attorney yeah. working on the public records. Yeah. 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 And uh, my impression from um, the, the one video they didn't get was some other surveillance video that, uh, that these officers didn't necessarily have. Um, Julian Jello, any other board discussion? All in favor of the dismissal? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Jensen, for your time. All right. Is, can you ask me? Can you ask me why? I can can I ask why it is that you don't feel the officers with re, they're refusing no, to give sir, the statement? We, it's we a public. Have, we've dismissed what? your case. We've dismissed your case. Um, so thank you very much for your time. No, your screw that. I'm still coming after them with attorneys. They were in the wrong. Uh, I, I can I'm sorry. It. Thank you. Goodbye. That's okay. All right. So, uh, committee reports. Zoom. Now the committee reports. Yeah. Several pending cases 
and one, one withdrawal. Right, you got anything with communications? Nothing. No. Right. Legislative. Um, there's two bills that we were watching that have been signed by the governor. The first one uh, was requirement to um, the repeal of the gender balance in appointing um, commissions. Uh, that was signed by the governor. Uh, there's another one that will have an impact um, uh, on us a little bit, probably not much, according to the Newspaper Association. This is the Senate file 2331. This is a bill that amended um, that a newspaper must post public notices on its um, public notices website. Um, at one time, it allowed for other uh, government entities to post on their internet site. And there was a um, issue with the publication with the newspaper that it would still count for the government body's use, but that was removed. Um, the way that it impacts IPIB is there is a provision in there that if there is a dispute arising under the publication requirement, the Iowa Public Information Board um, would uh, hear that dispute and could award prevailing costs and attorney fees to um, the, the winning uh, party on that side. So those two have been signed by the governor. Um, there's a couple of uh, bills that we were watching that I'm not sure are going to move forward. One that may move forward that would impact um, IPIB, uh, and I'm trying to find it quickly. It's a, a board and commission uh, bill that would mandate or change Chapter 21 to require that a government body provide for hybrid meetings, teleconference participation, virtual meetings, remote per participation, other hybrid options for the members of the government body to participate. Um, and no longer require that there be a designation in the minutes why an electronic meeting is necessary. Um, with that, I, that one may still go. Uh, I haven't seen it uh, anything before I came into here. Uh, the other uh, main bills that are still outstanding is the budget for IUPIP. Um, there's a very small, just general um, overall increase from the Senate. Um, like not much at all. And then in the House, there is uh, a slight increase of about uh, 42,000 to 43,000 um, to with the expectation that IPIP would uh, enhance its uh, training opportunities for government entities. There was a bill uh, that was proposed that would have mandated training for everyone subject to Chapter 21. Um, the, that uh, mandate was removed by the Senate and the bill has not moved forward. That was also the one with the increase uh, in fines, but that bill has not moved forward. Um, any other bills impacting Chapter 21 or 22 as of walking into this meeting have not moved forward. Uh, I think it's unlikely that they will be moving forward at this point. Where's this 90 days? Here's 90 days. That did not, they did not take that up at all. They really need to have so uh it's expected the writers are that they're going to finish up this week so we'll know our budget by then so and then i will be calling the legislative committee so that we can start working on things like um, text messages and retention and those types of rules uh no update on that on the office update um there has been an offer made out to an attorney um that uh will be wonderful you will love her um she has not officially signed the document and she's wrapping up the project so won't be starting uh, for a little while but she's um, hoping to come and meet everybody in may before she starts um but uh, i think you guys all will be find her or quite um, wonderful. We want to hire her before she meets us. <laughs> That's why I'm trying to get the sign done. <laughs> so, so hopefully she's going to try to be here for the meeting. Uh, any other updates? Yeah, um, it is with uh, mixed feelings 
that Erica has convinced me that I should uh, follow my spouse to South Carolina. Uh, she has taken a job with the University of South Carolina. And so uh, I will be leaving this position. Um, no date certain, although Erica keeps asking me if I left last week. Um, the, uh, uh, my, my Joanne has already started her position uh, in April, uh, April 1st, and I'm here until I find a job down there or I sell a house. So if anybody wants to buy a, buy a property, I have one for sale. And uh, um, uh, discussions, uh, Eric and I are working on the transition. I anticipate that I'll be gone by the first of the fiscal year. Knowing that the house takes 45 to 60 days to close. You don't have an offer on it, do you? Hmm? You don't have an offer? I've had two offers from investors to offer me about 53% on the dollar. Yeah. One year. The housing market is so tight. Oh, yeah. I'm, they're, I'm, we're not, uh, it's only been a list of two weeks. Yeah. Can we get a vote on this? Yeah, you, 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 you can. <laughs> my uh, cash offer. Uh, I don't know what the cash offer is. So, yeah, I've uh, very much enjoyed being here and uh, to accept that. I'm disappointed in leaving a job that I like, but uh, uh, I think our, our transition uh, is just happening a little sooner and we couldn't deny each other the opportunity. She's a development uh, person. So she's senior director of development for College of Arts and Sciences for the University of South Carolina. She so, doesn't really like it. She wants to go back to Iowa State, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, she, um, that was a, in a Columbia, right? In Columbia. So, Lebanon in Lexington. I have to quit forgetting to call it Lexington, Kentucky. Yes, you do. Um, but that would be quite a but uh, we are, uh, we have, yeah, we got a home there. And uh, I say that it feels like a VBRO when I visit all my own crappy junk in it. So, Good life for you. Plenty of golf courses for you, too. You know, 58 minutes from uh, destination. Oh. My house. Yeah, already, already the trap, though. So you got a spare room for Joel to watch the you, masters, right? You actually have one. I'm probably going to my house. I have a brother down there. Oh, Rent it out during the masters week. It's much more money even than you're an hour away. Really? So, oh. Wow. But anyways, okay. but uh, well, I'm just really, you didn't leave before. <laughs> I'm, I'm just holding down a chair. So long. Yeah. Great job. And uh, we've got to so we really do have a plan in place, um, the transition with the uh, new attorney coming in. Um, and then um, you know, what will happen after that, uh, we make some, Eric has made some good strategic decisions. So um, I'm not sure that'll all be laid out for you, but so uh, for my things get settled. So and I don't know about this hyper stuff. I don't think about all that. Age minus <laughs> age <laughs> minus uh, my, years of service. Uh, my dad was still alive. He can rattle everything. You can make a great question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <there you> <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I have them thinking that bad. I, I've got a whole bunch of advisory opinions I'm going to request for sure. <laughs> Who's this? I, we don't know him. That's, that's a big we gotta, We're going to work on new rules. No <laughs> advisory <laughs> opinions out, out of state. state. <laughs> it's all online now. Right? So, thank you all. No financial report, Eric, at all for the corporation. Yeah, uh, we're not going to run out of money, at least till next month. <laughs> <laughs> all right, presentations, trainings, got a, a couple already set, working on setting up uh, two or three others, um, just working on some dates there. So continuing to try to get out there and, and provide training where we can. Um, again, hoping that uh, Looking at potentially um, offering a just a standing remote website um, type of training for 
organizations. As we get fully staffed again, uh, people could sign up for it and just take it. Um, I think something like that might be useful. We talk to the legislators, um, Representative Moore, and we used to be on this board was really wanted to, to focus on getting some more training out there. So we're, we're going to try to uh, provide some more of that when we get back up, when we recover from Brad's leaving. So. District court update. Um, we're still waiting on the swarm decision. That was uh, the hearing on that was, I believe, in January. So just waiting for that decision to come down. Um, the appeal on the Med War case, that hearing is currently scheduled for April 26th. Um, that uh, tends to get rescheduled. Um, so we'll see if that one is going to go forward. And then we, our final appeal is the Van Pelt. And they are not the one that we took up with the video about the one before that with the contract um, that is on appeal. Uh, answer has been filed, but we don't have any schedule yet on that. Our next board meeting is um, May 15th. We are still um, working on whether or not that's going to be in here or not. There is some uh, uncertainty with the movement of government agencies um, of what will be available. DNR mostly has moved out of this building and this is their room. And so we're trying to figure out what happens um, with access to this room. So happy to answer any questions anyone has, but that's our report. So do I have a motion for adjournment? Oh, let me. <laughs> <laughs> motion to adjourn. Go ahead. Thanks everyone for the certificate. Thanks for the coach. Honored to. Hold in favor. Aye. Aye. Aye.